far. Yeah. All right. Uh, you, you can see my screen now, right? Yep. So I'm gonna make it big. Present. All right. So, yeah, maybe you want to introduce Julie a bit. Um, yes. So, Jose, we invite you to, to the GOSH community call because you're part of the team developing uh, a new open hardware mentorship program. And um, I think it will be interesting for the community to understand what uh, the, the mentorship program is about while it's being developed so we can get all the feedback before it's closed, let's say. Um, and um, yes, just go on and <laughs> explain what it's about. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation, guys. I just uh, put the link uh, below of what is uh, Mozilla Open OLX because my people don't know. So just click there and you check it out. But basically, I think uh, you have explained to the community that it's just that Mozilla has this open leaders program that we all have followed up or we have uh, contributed or collaborated with. And we decided to get together to do the same, but with a focus on, on open hardware, right? So this program is precisely about it. So this is what we have come up with uh, in the discussion of the team. What is the purpose of the program? So we want to empower project leads. Uh, so developers, uh, people are working in open hardware to build their own communities. And uh, in that way also, uh, have more successful hardware projects by using best practices uh, and things that we learn together and disseminate in the community. Uh, a good example is what we were just talking about uh, hardware data management and pro project data management, how to do it, what practice to follow. That's a good example of, of uh, things we could talk about in the program and, and share. And the outcome is something that we all want, which is uh, we want to see consolidated open source hardware projects and communities that sustain. And uh, yeah, and then we are going to talk a bit about how can we do it, um, what kind of ideas and assumptions we have, we have made. And yeah, this is already two main assumptions that we are making. So it's good to have feedback already on this. So feel free to do it afterwards. So this is the program uh, developers. Uh, yes, yeah, for you guys to know. I shared the link also so you can look the, at the slides later and go into the details. And uh, this is kind of our proposition or main idea. Why, why are we doing exactly this program uh, and this kind of learning experience that we are developing? It's because we believe that uh, learning and teaching uh, will help us in, in consolidating these open source projects and communities. Uh, and we also believe that developing and sharing practices together through this training uh, can help to develop these capacities that we all need because, you know, there are many people that are interested in open hardware, but, but in, for, us, for instance, in the software industry, uh, you, can, you can see that there are a lot of roadmaps. If you want to become a front-end developer or a back-end developer or a data analyst, there are certain things that you should follow up in order to be equipped with the toolkits that you need to, to yeah, to practice that, that craft, right? So we need something similar in hardware. And I think a good way is to uh, have these communities of practice uh, through the programs and learning and mentoring. So my background, just to give a, a quick background, I'm an industrial designer and also have worked as a UX designer. Now I'm working as a front-end developer and in the meantime, uh, collaborating with Theo Delph on a course okay. design about product repairability and circular design of products and stuff like that. So this is also something I shared for you guys to check later, but it's my personal pathway in open hardware, which is a bit uh, kind of zigzagging, but it's cool to share like, uh, Perhaps one thing is that I've started as a bugger. I was a really fan of uh, open source ecology. So I just started donating to them. Then I applied as a developer and then I got into Mozilla and made the, I, I met uh, Andre and Julie there. 
and the process has been basically of going on and going and learning uh, just by doing and, and seeing others do stuff. So that's kind of the way I've got into, into it. Uh, all right, so let's talk a bit about the program now. Uh, what is our audience? So that these are two important assumptions we're making. We want to focus on people that are developing open hardware projects uh, and they are interested in onboarding contributors and growing their communities of practice. Because yeah, you can document a project and put it out there, but that doesn't automatically create a, a community. Sometimes the project has, can be so cool that it can automatically grow a community, but I would say there has to be a lot of promotion and other kind of tools that we need to uh, onboard people and make it successfully. That's something we are still finding out and learning. So the other audience is people that want to introduce and facilitate open hardware communities in their context. For instance, institutions like universities, there are people that are really fascinated about the topic, but they are not necessarily uh, hardware developers or people that are uh, familiar with the topic. So we need to also assist them and facilitate them in in yeah and bringing these topics into their context for instance another example is farmers there are farmers can benefit a lot from many things uh, like sharing solutions and things they do that in forums now but they are not so cultivated into open hardware and i know i happen to know one guy that is very active in developing hardware stuff and he's a farmer and yeah he's struggling with introducing these topics in the in his community so uh, I also share a link here about cultivating communities of practice because yeah, it's interesting um, the role of identity and people coming together. Perhaps it has more influence than the technical stuff, you know? So it's something nice to check out. So I also uh, put in red here, uh, so project leads, communities and best practices because yeah, what 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 are those so maybe it's good to just um, go through examples so this is manolis this is a farmer i was just talking about it's a persona this is uh, an exercise that we did for to building up the course and uh, just uh, why i'm sharing this is because the experience that i had with him is that he was a, a developer at open source ecology and then i started helping him to learn git because he didn't know how to use git or gitlab uh, to make version control. So it's a good example of someone that wants to do stuff. He, he is a maker, but he was not necessarily into these kind of tools. And uh, the way we work together is that I said, okay, I can help you in doing a static website generator and teach you how to use Git. And he just started doing it. Now he's, yeah, he has been struggling with getting people on board because he's working with relatively big machines. So it's very difficult to work remotely with him. So this is an example of the kind of things that have happened. This is another example of a guy that is doing a Libre Solar en uh, open hardware for solar energy, DC systems, uh, Martin. So in his case, what I could do is uh, uh, help him to use ViewPress to document his project and stuff. But the point is that, uh, yeah, in this, in this, in all these cases, we have. I have been trying to disseminate some practices, sharing some tools, and that's it. But that is not, that has been very ad hoc, that hasn't been structured. So it's an example of things that we want to happen in a more structured setup, in a more maintainable setup. And uh, these are examples of Julie. So uh, if we look at all these people, I, I would like to highlight that they are kind of domain experts or people that know their context very well. They are not necessarily technical experts, they are not engineers, but they know quite well what they want or why they want something, right? They don't necessarily are the best at how to do it. So they might, that, that's also another reason why it's good that they, uh, through the program, get a culture of how to uh, partner up with technical experts, how to, how to for instance, uh, develop specifications or requirements so that they can tell uh, uh, an engineer, okay, I would like to do this, I would like to do that, can you help me with this or that? 
so it's an example uh, and yeah this is these are examples mainly i would say of people that know very well their context and they are kind of power users or innovators i would say correct me if i'm wrong julie but that's how i see it no that's fine this these two are, are um open science hardware um examples like scientists that start, start making open science hardware and are a bit lost on how to move on mm -hmm. yeah so so this is the kind of situation in which i think many projects are um, um, yeah, and we would like to improve that experience through the program uh, so, so that we actually end up with consolidated uh, projects and communities. So uh, I'm going again to try to answer how we are trying to do it, what are the ideas, and I think, uh, yeah, we, it's a, a bit of a joke, but I think it has also a bit of truth. Uh, you learn to dance mostly by dancing. The more you dance, the better you'll get at it. It's not that you're gonna be like Michael Jackson or whatever, but definitely uh, my experience is that it's like a craft. So the more you try to improve at it, the more you try to understand uh, the context of open hardware and how it could uh, be successful. Uh, yeah, the better you will try to, the better you, you, you will respond to your context. Uh, so what, what is one of the ideas that we have is to develop this concept of immersive learning experience because it's something that we have experienced with Mozilla before. So uh, Mozilla is very successful in the Open Leaders program because they are very immersive. They get you in contact with people. Actually, that's why we are here now. So they are successful in that. Um, and we want to replicate their experience, basically. We want to learn from uh, their success and try to see how we can do it in this context. So a way to do it, which is something that I do as, at the same time, is to apply knowledge and do exercise on specific hardware project. So let's say you have a hardware project or idea, and uh, it is always good to try to apply knowledge and do exercises like we are doing actually to build this program. And in our context, uh, uh, I think it is important to understand the user uh, context and the domain context. So the domain is not just the user. Let's say, for instance, when we're talking about uh, scientific open hardware or lab open hardware, you need to understand the life cycle of experiments. You need to understand the, the specific context in, when it, in which people are using the, the things. Just to give you an example, I was uh, working with the centrifuge I'm not a domain expert in, in lab equipment. So the only thing I could do was to apply a bit my technical expertise to ask domain experts uh, how they, how they, yeah, why they use the centrifuge in which context. And they also, let's say, have their own language. Like for instance, in centrifuge, uh, the FCR is more important than the RPM. I didn't know that. So, these are things that you need to find out. Uh, so when you are not a domain expert and you're working on a hardware project, you need to try to find domain experts and be trained in doing so, right? And also modeling that domain so that you are successful, which is basically context understanding. And with the user, I would say it's the same as part of the domain center design. Uh, so we have another scenario where we can have someone that is very, uh, very knowledgeable about the context, but might not be knowledgeable about the technical possibilities and the technical considerations for implementing their ideas. In that case, they would need to, uh, yeah, to learn a bit, have a bit of culture of technical center design. Like for instance, in, in hardware architecture is very important, how uh, the cost of the components, uh, organizing uh, data, using data sheets, all these kind of things might be things that are not uh, you, um, how do you say? Uh, yeah, frequently used by by non-technical people. You can also have a mix of both, right? Uh, but I tell you, in my experience, I've worked with uh, engineers, and you you can feel the difference when you are a designer and engineer how how they can combine. Like uh, I felt that I worked with a very good Brazilian friend. He was an engineer, and he knew everything about technology. You could say this is a good option, this is not a good option, 
and I was more playing the role of a product owner where I knew more or less the context of why I wanted to do something. So that was a good combination. Now there is another topic, which is community centered design, which is something that we're still learning. So how do we uh, design our projects and our channels and our strategy in a way that is community centered, in a way that is empowering and actually onboarding the right people for the project to succeed. The people that uh, can benefit from it or preparing the people that might be users and so this kind of stuff, which is more collectively driven, is another topic I would say that I would differentiate from the other two. And we can do exercises and try to practice about it. And the other one is a valorization strategy, which is a big topic that I think we need to tackle still, which is how do we uh, create, uh, uh, let's say, cash flow or uh, revenue streams or a way to sustain the resources that we need to develop hardware because it's very difficult if if you don't have uh, if you don't have a place to manufacture things or you don't have some uh, minimum budget to acquire components uh, it's tough so a good way is to develop kits or uh, uh, find a way to make your hardware pro uh, project a product and again doing that demands of an understanding of the context and the domain and the opportunities so we want to talk about it also as well in the program and we want to uh, yeah to uh, mentor and help people in doing so and learning from others so i would say that these four things that we have been talking about are i would consider them strategic design tools so things that are not related too much with github or gitlab or stuff but more about things that no matter what technologies or, or let's say details, uh, I think every project lead should master or every community leader should master or try to aim to, to master. We are still doing that as well, by the way. We are learning about it. So uh, another thing that I would like to stress is that uh, these tools will help people to generate hypotheses and concepts about what they want and how they, they it can be successful, but it also involves validating and testing those in a in an agile way, so that we make quick assumptions and we see if they are true or not by prototyping and making tests and experiments. This uh, presentation is a good example. We are sharing the assumptions with you, with the community, and we are going to find out if these assumptions are relevant for you or not. And Otherwise, we would have to reconsider some things. So another thing that we believe that uh, will work in the program because it worked with Mozilla before is that we are going to directly support the participants. So we want to go along with the participants in onboarding uh, contributors and leveraging community resources together. So for instance, let me give you an example. Sometimes in a certain context, you may you might need to have a template on how to suggest a feature or uh, an improvement in a product because people don't know how to do it. So you might have a guideline like, okay, what is your feature? Specify if you can work on it or not. It's good that people know if you are familiar with the topic or not. So things that make easier for others to um, to join and contribute successfully. Uh, and the last one is that we, as Mozilla does as well, we believe that support from participants uh, to the community will make people grow. So I think, I don't know about you guys, but I've learned perhaps even more by being a mentor than by being a mentee in these programs. So when you, when you want to, when you have to teach someone something, you are a bit more responsible and you try to make your best. So that makes you go through, uh, yeah, through the topics you're talking about and try to address them with rigor. Uh, so it all, it always, it, it is always a, a next step of learning to mentor. So we believe that that is a that should be a core uh, element of the program. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of the plan. So this kind of, let's say, aspects that we have been talking about 
are trying to address also how can we sustain, improve, and expand such a program because we believe that we are like now four, we are now four, so four people definitely cannot mentor most of the people that are out there that might be interested in this program. So the idea is to keep growing uh, in different rounds and scaling up a bit. And again, uh, big questions are how do we, uh, how can we reproduce and sustain it? How can we find scalable solutions? So when we have so many hardware projects, version is very important, uh, findability is very important, interoperability of data is very important. I think uh, there is gonna be a future in federated data because there are many people that have their own platforms and they wanna keep having their own platform because it's related to their own identities, but still they can have open standards that can interoperate and can, let's say, federate, you know? So scalability is something that, that we should be talking about because it's not just about isolated projects, but actually uh, aggregating that capacity uh, as a community. And that is also a big topic, I think. <clears throat> and the last one is also how can we expand it coherently? Because yeah, you can grow and have many repos and many things doing stuff, but again, we don't, it's not easy to find, it's not easy to search, it's not easy to understand the context. So how can we provide coherence in this process of uh, content creation? So those are the topics. And again, uh, part of the answer is that we will have to keep dancing and see, <laughs> and see if we get better and we, you know, get the rhythm in the hips. So that's pretty much it, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>